It's November 28th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with a record November snowfall here in Seoul. The heaviest November snowstorm in 117 years continued to hit the capital overnight and into Thursday morning, with 40 centimeters of snow stacking up in the city. President Yoon Song Yeol hosted Ukraine's special delegation on Wednesday and agreed to continue sharing intelligence on deepening military collaboration between Russia and North Korea. A 60-day ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah is now in full swing in Lebanon, with leaders around the world renewing their calls for a Gaza ceasefire and hostage release. People here in South Korea woke up to another huge pile of snow this morning. And the rare November heavy snowfall is not yet over with more in the forecast. We connect with our An Sung Jin. Good morning, Tommy. Indeed, now a lot of people like myself have been leaving to work early due to concerns over public transportation or traffic jams. Now I'm sure you can see behind me the snow that's been piled on rooftops on the buildings behind me from the heavy snowfall overnight. The capital's hull was blanketed with at least 12 cent 16 centimeters of snow yesterday, which beat the city's previous record of 12.4 centimeters from 1972 for the month of November. This year's snowfall also ranks third in terms of how much has fallen. Removal work continues as we speak, but some roads in the center of Seoul are still blocked off and many have been rerouted, slowing down traffic. Most Hall metro lines, including Line 1 and Suimbundang Line, added 23 more trains running during peak rush hour. The Korean Railroad Corporation, as well as Seoul Metro, extended peak running hours by 30 minutes, but delays were inevitable across the metropolitan region. With continued snow overnight, the government is to maintain Level 2 of the Center Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters response level. Gyeonggi-do province also raised its emergency level to level 3 starting from 10 p.m. last night. It's the first time in 12 years that the region has activated level 3 due to snow. You know, on top of all the hassle for commuters, the record snow also led to reports of injuries, blackouts and even fatalities. Tell us more about that. Right, Tommy. As of 6 a.m. this morning, at least two people died and more than 50 people had to temporarily evacuate due to snow and heavy snowfall across the entire country. There are more than 1,000 rescue efforts or reports filed related to snow incidents and power shortages affected thousands of households as, as, as electricity lines were damaged by falling trees and snow-related causes. Due to the snowfall, at least 100 flights have been destroyed, delayed or grounded. Incheon International Airport has warned passengers to pay close attention to their flight schedule and any changes. More than 10,000 personnel carried out snow removal work overnight. Snow is expected to stop in most areas of Seoul and northern Gyeonggi-do province by this afternoon, while areas in Gangwon-do province and southern Gyeonggi-do province will see the snow stop in the evening. The government and local government will remain on alert for any further accidents and have cautioned that as parts of streets and roads are still, still frozen, pedestrians should remain cautious. That's all I have for you now. Back to you. All righty, Ansung, thank you so much for that report. You stay warm there. In other news, President Yoon sung yeol hosted a Ukrainian delegation led by its defense minister to discuss effective cooperation against the illegal military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. Our Oh Soo-young has the details. President Yoon sung yeol met with a Ukrainian delegation to discuss how to counter the growing military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. According to Yun's office, the South Korean leader on Wednesday met with the visiting delegation led by Kyiv's Defence Minister Rustam Umarov at the Yongsan Presidential Office. During their talks, Yun called for Seoul and Kyiv to devise practical and effective strategies to address the threat posed by Moscow and Pyongyang. As Umarov provided an update on Ukraine's war situation and North Korea's troop movements, the Ukrainian minister expressed gratitude for South Korea's support which has provided tangible assistance to the Ukrainian people and expressed hope for strengthening their cooperation in the future. He said the delegation is visiting after President Volodymyr Zelensky ordered him to explore cooperation with South Korea amid Russia and North Korea's military collaboration. The delegation's visit was announced late October following a phone call between Yoon and Zelensky after South Korean intelligence confirmed North Korean troops were being deployed to fight for Russia and Ukraine. 
The delegation held further talks with National Security Advisor Shin won sik and Defence Minister Kim jong un to explore further avenues for bilateral cooperation. The two sides agreed to continue intel sharing on North Korea's troop deployments and the regime's arms and technology transfers with the Kremlin. They will also work closely with allied nations to address these issues. The top office did not mention or comment on whether Ukraine had asked for weapon support. However, observers believe artillery and air defense systems may have been requested, as hinted by the Ukrainian president last month, when he said the delegation will soon visit South Korea. So far, South Korea has only provided non-lethal military gear such as bulletproof vests. However, in recent weeks, Seoul has said it will classify weapons into either defensive or offensive categories. It would consider providing defensive weapons first and adjust its response in stages proportionately to developments. Going forward, Seoul will coordinate with Washington on its future decisions regarding the Ukraine war. Yun's office says as the Biden administration and President-elect Trump's team are responding to the Ukraine crisis as a unified team. South Korea will maintain close communication and cooperation with the US to ensure all decisions are made within the framework of their bilateral cooperation. Oh Seung, Arirang News. And President Yoon will this afternoon hold a summit with Latvian President Edgars Lingovic to discuss and enhance a bilateral cooperation. As far as the presidential office said, the two leaders will sit down for talks while the Latvian president is on a four-day working visit to the country. There are expected to be discussions on ways to enhance a practical cooperation between South Korea and Latvia, as well as strategies to promote collaboration on regional and international fronts. Over in the Middle East, with a 60-day ceasefire in place between Israel and Hezbollah, Israel imposed a last-minute curfew which prohibits any Lebanese person from crossing over to the south of Lebanon. Isin Jasmore. As of 4 a.m. Wednesday local time, the 60-day ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hezbollah came into effect. Just over 12 hours later, Israel's Arab spokesperson announced that Israel is imposing a curfew which prevents anyone from Lebanon from entering the south of Lebanon. According to the statement, as of 5 p.m. Wednesday local time, anyone north of the Litani River is prohibited from moving south, while those south of the river must remain where they are. It further warned that the Israeli military is still deployed in southern Lebanon in accordance with the ceasefire agreement and will deal firmly with any movement that violates the agreement. Lebanon also announced on the first day of the ceasefire that it would increase the number of government troops deployed to the south of the country to 10,000. The announcement was made by its defense minister, who said that the increase in troop presence is part of its ceasefire agreement. The troop deployment comes as the ceasefire agreement stipulates that the only forces that can possess weapons during the ceasefire are the government and other regular forces, completely banning Hezbollah from having weapons during the 60 days. With little to no progress being made on a ceasefire agreement in Gaza, U.S. President Joe Biden renewed his push for a deal. Biden took to X on Wednesday to say that the U.S. will make another push for a ceasefire deal in Gaza and for hostages to be released. The leaders of Egypt and Jordan are also working to broker a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. Egyptian President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi and King Abdullah II of Jordan met in Cairo on Wednesday to discuss the need for an immediate ceasefire in the enclave. The two leaders also issued a statement praising the ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah while rejecting the displacement of Palestinians. Meanwhile, after the ceasefire in Lebanon was announced, Hezbollah announced that it's preparing a funeral procession for its slain leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Nasrallah was killed in a massive Israeli airstrike in Beirut in September, which drastically escalated the conflict in the Middle East. Isinje, Arirang News. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has picked a retired three-star general to serve as his special envoy for Ukraine and Russia. Talking to his Truth social media platform on Wednesday, Trump announced he had chosen Keith Kellogg as the special envoy. Trump said his pick would secure peace through strength, adding that they will make both America and the world safe again. The 80-year retired general has long been the president-elect's advisor on defense issues and served as a national security advisor to former Vice President Mike Pence. He also served as the acting security advisor for Trump. 
Tension to flared at the UN Security Council on Wednesday as the U.S. and Ukraine criticized North Korea's troop deployment to support Russia's war in Ukraine. U.S. Deputy Ambassador Robert Wood directly asked North Korean Ambassador Kim Song if troops have been sent to Russia. In response, Kim indirectly acknowledged the deployment, stating that North Korea will faithfully uphold its obligations under the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Treaty with Russia. Ukraine's ambassador Sergei Kislicha denounced Kim, calling him a representative of a criminal regime. South Korean ambassador Hwang Jung-guk also said that North Korean troops are in Kursk, involved in combat with casualties reported, and he urged North Korea and Russia to halt their illegal military cooperation and withdraw the troops. The South Korea Central Bank lowered its benchmark interest rate by 25 basis points once again amid stagnant economic growth. The decision was announced this morning during the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting of the year and follows the last month's rate cut of 25 basis points. This comes as the country's third quarter GDP growth tallied up to only 0.1 percent, and inflation is stabilizing with consumer prices rising by 1.3 percent year on year in October. So the central bank has decided to wrap up the year with one last rate cut. Let's discuss in detail with Professor Yang Yidong this morning. Thanks for joining us. Hi, good morning. So I feel like the rate cut came as more of a surprise. Why do you think made them cut the rate for the second time? Well, it was pretty interesting to know that uh, for the past 16 years, the BOK never lowered the base interest twice in a row. Uh, you know, the, the last time that they went down uh, the interest rate uh, t- twice in a row was year 2008, when we had the very uh, national emergencies due to a financial crisis. So why, you know, BOK has lowered the, the interest rate twice in a row, you know, uh, for the first time in the past, the, 16th. the first one is our economic condition is so, so worrisome. Mm. In the second quarter of this year, our economic growth, you know, turned to negative minus uh, 0.2. In the third quarter, our growth rate stayed at 0.1. And for the next year, lots of economic research centers turned very pessimistic. For example, BOK announced that, that they lowered their next year's growth from uh, 2.1 to 1.9. IMF in this month, November, lowered from 2.2 to 2.0. KDI from 2.1 to 2.0. Goldman Sachs from uh, you know, the uh, two point to one point eight, right. and Morgan Stanley, numerous securities, JP Morgan, all those institutions still staying with one point seven. So it, that is a major driver for why the BOK lower the, the base interest rate. Uh, Professor Young, then I have to ask you, how necessary was the rate cut in terms of stability in the long term? Well, the we should think about the impacts of the. Uh, uh, or the growth of export. Well, the export is not necessarily related to the interest rate, but uh, we have very worrisome forecast for the next year due to very uncertainty of American government's economic uh, policies. Donald Trump declared that the, he wants to in, the increase the tariff up to 60% for uh, Chinese import and uh, one over 20% for the general uh, tariff even 25% for the imports from Mexico and Canada. You know, lots of Ukrainian companies have invested a lot of money to Mexico right, to benefit from the new uh, government policy uh, that tried to replace uh, NAFTA in the first the regime of Donald Trump. But every in the policies, every economic uh, regulation have turned so uncertain. So, uh, you know, our economy depends about more than 30% for the export. You know, for the sake of our GDP, unless we, uh, you know, the increase, improve our economic conditions with this kind of very different approaches like interest rate, you know, we cannot uh, make up for the expected, you know, the very pessimist impacts from this uncertain mm. uh, the American uh, trade policies for our for the sake of our G- uh, GDP and also export growth. That is a major, uh, you know, the, the big issue. Right. And what was also announced earlier this morning is that the central bank lowering the growth rate to 2.2 percent for next year, 2025. Now, should we be relieved that it's still above the 2 percent range? Well, I hope so. But uh, many people estimated that, uh, 
uh, they still estimate that uh, the Federal Reserve Bank will lower their base rates by uh, 25 BPs again mm. in December. So I think BOK has a very solid confidence that uh, they can keep the very stable margin between the best interests between the uh, BOK and FLB. That could be another reason why BOK decided to uh, lower their base interest rates. And besides, you know, if we are surrounded by all this pessimistic forecast for the next year's economic growth, I know what else can you do? You have to do something to, you know, uh, stimulate the economic expectation for the next year by lowering interest rates. So we need some stimulus. We need some stimulus from mm. the BOK so that we should be conf we really confirm that every major authorities in Korea, like BOK, in Korean government, has great concerns for the economic growth for the next year. So I think it is a very timely decision from BOK. Well, then uh, well, the, the BOK decided to wrap up the year with one last cut, uh, last rate cut. Now, is it safe to say there'll be more rate cuts in the coming months, you know, in the first half of 2025? I think so. Oh. Because as I already said, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in the United States, you know, is very much highly expected to lower their BPs by 25 BPs in December. And the next meeting of a BOK for financial market control will be held in January next year. Mm -hmm. So they will keep on monitoring what's going on in the uh, FLB. And if uh, FLB lowers their best interest as the market you know, the expects, absolutely be okay. We'll go ahead to lower the uh, uh, base interest rates by 25% more. Still, we may keep the same levels, same gaps between uh, uh, be okay in FLB. So we still have some slacks to lower our the base interest rates, and it really, really makes sense to uh, promote our economic activities. Right, which makes the to, uh, today's rate cut more timely than ever. Now, uh, with yes. the economy outlook looking, you know, increasingly rather bleak, uh, calls to be prepared to cope with worst case situations are also growing. The question is, what measures should there be to boost economic vitality at this point? Well, if you get focused on the uh, very gloomy perspective for next year, we should be concerned about three major forces for this uncertainty. The first one comes from Donald Trump. Mm. Um, I mean, Donald Trump has declared that they want, he wants to uh, charge very high tariffs over the, all the imports from all over the world, up to 60% from China. Directly and directly, many experts estimate that our GDP will be lowered, will be affected by negatively from this policy up to even 1.1% point in terms of economic growth, which is a very, very, uh, you know, a big concern. As I already said, Donald Trump even, you know, wants to turn over his uh, predetermined, uh, the, uh, pol the trade policies, USMCA replacing NAFTA in the second regime of uh, his tenure. So he's so out of control. He is so uh, unexpected. And second uncertainty factor is decrease in our, the semiconductors and, uh, uh, the automobiles. And these are two major items pushing our export. But next year, our semiconductor growth will be uh, will be stay about 2.2, even though its growth rate is about over 40% this year. Automobiles will be decreased by almost 2%. So these are the, the, these are major concerns. The third reason is our domestic consumption will decrease about 2% next year. So all the three factors, you know, ask all of us, be okay, and Korean government to do something. If we lose this time, you know, the uh, policy, I mean, we never know what happened in the next year. Right. Already, Professor Young, thanks so much for connecting with us this morning. We appreciate it as always. Thank you. Have a good day. Good morning, I'm Kim ji -young, and this is The World Now. Several of U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's cabinet nominees and administration picks have been targeted with bomb threats and swatting, according to Trump's spokesperson. Carolyn Levitt said in a statement that the threats were made on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, while the FBI said it was aware of numerous bomb threats and swatting incidents targeting Trump's government nominees. 
The alleged threats were made to Trump's pick for U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Elise Stefanik, and the nominee for the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, Lee Zeldin, while Brooke Rollins nominated to lead the Department of Agriculture, as well as Scott Turner and Laurie chavez Derrima, Trump's pick for Department of Housing and Labor Secretary, respectively, posted on social media that they have also received threats. Now, Fox News also reported that Defense Secretary nominee Pete Hegseth and Trump's pick for director of the CIA, John Ratcliffe, also received threats. The spokesperson for Trump's transition team added that these appointees were targeted in violent, un-American threats to, to their lives and those who live with them, while saying the violence will not deter us. Chile's president, Gabriel Boric, has come under fire after a preliminary investigation was launched regarding a sexual harassment complaint. Chile's Attorney General, Christian Crisosto, stated that the criminal case was confirmed on Tuesday by the prosecutor's office in Magallanes, in the south of the country, where the alleged harassment took place while Boric was a lawmaker in the region. The youngest president in Chile's history, 38-year-old Boric, allegedly sexually harassed a woman in 2013 by sending dozens of non-consensual emails, including one where he sent explicit images that were not requested or consented to when he was living in the city of Punta Arenas. President Boric denied the allegations through his lawyer, who said that the president is the victim of a situation of systematic harassment. The Indian Coast Guard reported a record seizure of 5.5 metric tons of methamphetamine from a Myanmar-operated fishing boat in the Andaman Sea on Tuesday. Six Myanmarese citizens were arrested in the bust, which the Indian Coast Guard stated was the biggest ever drug haul by the authority. The Indian Coast Guard's reconnaissance party found a suspicious small fishing boat carrying a Myanmar flag and alerted the authorities, which shadowed the small vessel until arrests were made early Monday. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands Director General of Police said that the market value of the seized drugs would be some four billion US dollars. Ukrainian free diver Katerina Sadurska has set a new world record in the no fins discipline of the sport. 32-year-old Sadurska dived 82 meters in three minutes and 10 seconds off the coast of Dominica on Tuesday, breaking her own previous world record of 80 meters. Now it marks her sixth world record in free diving to date. She said that her training was not easy as she could not train in her war-torn home country, but said that she is really happy to do this dive. We are facing a lot of record-breaking extreme weather conditions this year so far, and the snow is no exception. The capital area is covered by its heaviest November snow on record. While snow removal work didn't seem to be catching up with the blizzard earlier in the day, overnight nearly 8 centimeters more snow has piled up in the capital. Concern is on the rise as more snow is in the forecast for most of central areas with snow warning issued in the capital and northern parts of Chungcheong Bukdo province. And of course, a strong wind is no help. Snow looks to come down heavily during the morning with 3 to 8 centimeters in the forecast in the capital and surrounding regions. Heavier in Gangwondo and Chungcheong Bukdo province with up to 15 centimeters in the forecast. Now, afternoon temperatures should go up a couple of degrees higher at 4 degrees here in Seoul, 9 degrees Celsius in Daegu. But feels like temperatures should be much lower with biting winds. A mix of rain and snow continues news tomorrow, so please take it easy and stay safe out on the road. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
This is where we wrap things up. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.